All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another installment of the Interstellar Probe Study webinar series. My name is James Mistandria, and I am the Deputy Study Manager for the Interstellar Probe Study. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's webinar. We have a wonderful presentation today on the Engineering Lifetime Study. And after the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. Before we start, I would like to outline the logistics of today's event. As a member of the audience, your audio and video are off. During the presentation, please submit your questions in the question and answer feature, and please indicate which panelist your question is for. During the question and answer session, I will start with questions with the largest amount of upvotes and proceed down the list. For more information about the Interstellar Probe Study and for information on future webinars, please visit the Interstellar Probe Study website. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers, who are all from the Interstellar Probe Study engineering team. Glenn Fountain has been a member of the Space Exploration Staff at the Applied Physics Lab for over 50 years. He served as the New Horizons Project Manager from 2004 through the Pluto flyby in 2015, stepping down from that role in 2016, but still supporting the New Horizons project, among other activities. Glenn is the Deputy Project Manager and Lifetime Study Lead for the Interstellar Probe Study. Dr. Clay Smith is a member of the Principal Professional Staff at the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory with over 35 years of experience analyzing systems from risk, reliability, and safety perspectives. These systems include NASA missions, payloads, and ground systems. Dr. Smith is currently the Reliability Engineering Lead for the Interstellar Probe Study. Sally Whitley has been a member of the Space Exploration Staff at the Applied Physics Lab for over 10 years, is a certified actuary, and has conducted cost and schedule risk quantification for several NASA missions that include the Parker Solar Probe mission, the DART mission, and the Europa Imaging System for the Europa Clipper mission. She has also performed risk quantification for many NASA proposals, including Discovery and New Frontier proposals. Sally served as a reliability engineer of Psyche's Gamma Ray and Neutron Spectrometer Instrument and is the lead for the ground segment longevity study for the interstellar probe study. And now for the presentations. Glenn, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, James. Um, good afternoon, at least for those on the East Coast. Uh, I'd like to spend some time uh, talking about the background for the, for the study we're talking about and a little bit about one of the aspects. Can I have the next chart, please? And the next chart. So this is a chart that many of you will find familiar in one form or the other. Uh, the idea behind the chart is to illustrate why we need a longevity study. To get to the region that the interstellar probe is needed to get to is this region beyond 200 astronomical units. And we should be well beyond that, that distance at a rate of about eight astronomical units a year, you need to get well beyond 25 years. And the number we have chosen for this study is 50 years, which will get us well into the region of interest for the interstellar probe study. So therefore, we're looking for missions that can operate for a very long duration. Next chart. So as I said, the, the longevity study has been motivated by, by this need to operate as a requirement for 50 years. Voyager is operated for 43, but its requirement was four, five years. The New Horizons mission is now into its uh, something like 13th, 14th year now. At launch, it had a requirement for 15 years. No mission has had an operational requirement for the 50 years that we're requiring. So for this study, we have two principal goals. One is to identify processes for both the flight system, the supporting ground infrastructure, and for the mission staffing to assure a successful outcome for a mission when the required duration is 50, 50 years. And then we wanna also look at uh, other missions, what they tell us about the lo longevity of missions, what the challenges are, so that when we uh, provide guidance from our study, 
for future mission uh, planning, uh, there will be some understanding of how we've derived our own recommendations. Uh, the study in team includes a number of people. You've heard uh, about Dr. Clay Smith and Ms. Sally Whitley, um, and the, but there are others, uh, Steve Jaskulik, uh, Dr. Janet Bertessi at Princeton, and uh, others that you see here that have been helping with this study as well as the larger interstellar probes study team. Next chart. So we've got a number of activities that we need to do to, to get our understanding and to provide the information that our study will report out at its end. One of the things we want to do is review the literature uh, for spacecraft reliability. Uh, we have collected uh, literature. We've got essentially a bibliography of over 60 uh, references that we've been pulled in and you'll hear uh, about some of those in later talks today. Uh, we've also reached out to other organizations for information uh, to, and then we're going to use that information to understand uh, how those systems uh, operated for long periods of time and what lessons we can learn from them. We'll also look for what we can learn from them to map out failure modes uh, and increase our own uh, understanding of what the interstellar probe architecture needs to do to minimize the failure modes and uh, give us assurance that we have a design that will operate for 50 years. Not only we want to develop this understanding, but we want to articulate the processes uh, so that uh, we have an understanding of the architecture options, uh, identify the risks that uh, undergird a 50-year lifetime requirement, and but also look at the ground system longevity as well as the human resources, as I spoke to a little bit ago. Next chart. So, uh, among other Organizations you see here are a list of organizations uh, at NASA, Goddard, JPL, NOAA that we're reaching out, uh, we have developed missions uh, that are uh, in the tw 20 year or so uh, region, but we wanna understand what they can tell us about missions well beyond 20 years. Wanna identify other enterprises, uh, and other activities that successfully performed for long periods of time. And one of the examples that is not a space mission is a, a device called the, the Oxford Electric Bell. Uh, the Oxford Electric Bell is a device it's, it's created in 1840 and it's been operating ever since. It's made up of, of two electric piles and a pendulum with, a, at the end of it, a small four millimeter ball that then moves back and forth between the two piles, uh, ringing them, um, a, a piece of them, uh, at a two hertz rate. It is continually operated since 1840. And you can find it at Oxford University now, therefore the Oxford Electric Bell. Um, so that's a device that's operated for a very long time. On the Voyager mission, uh, the low energy uh, charged particle instrument has a stepper motor. It is successfully operated for 43 years. So we have some very good examples of long lived instruments and uh, systems uh, that we can begin to build a uh, basis of understanding. And you'll hear more about how we've more quantitatively done that uh, very shortly. And then, of course, we want to share the results uh, with the community through publications, uh, workshops, panel discussions. Uh, we will have panel discussions at both the AIAA Ascend Conference in November, as well as SciTech 2021 uh, in January. Next. So one other element I wish to talk a little bit about is the human element. Uh, 
And not only do you have to have the systems that operate, but you gotta have the human beings that will make the system operate and use the system. There are a number of groups to consider, both the science community stakeholders, uh, the wider space community will be interested in the data, but it, specifically the members of the community that will be participating directly and provide the leadership for such an inter mission as the interstellar probe. Obviously the engineering team that operates, uh, both designs and operates the mission, as well as the wider community that will have a stake in the mission. As you see here, NASA, Congress, and the public. And we gotta put mechanisms in place to assure that the key, the key knowledge about the mission can be maintained across multiple generations. Uh, the people that designed and developed this mission, the leaders of that generation, will no longer be in the arena and be doing this work when we get to our place of interest in 50 years. Next, next. Next, uh, oh yes, here we go. So mission leadership. So for 50 years uh, duration requires a different way of looking at the team uh, than uh, previous missions. Uh, the normal PI model of ownership won't really work for this, uh, given the, that by definition, the, the mission itself will most likely outlive the original leadership team. So a mission organizational structure that is more bureaucratic uh, is probably a better mechanism for doing that. You know, you think of systems like the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute and others in which the original developers of those instruments uh, uh, are no, lo no longer responsible for the operation of, of the system as a, as a model. Um, and we're gonna be looking at those models and what will be appropriate for an interstellar probe mission. Next. One of the things that I think to, actually works to our advantage is the likely mission tempo of an interstellar probe. Uh, we can take advantage that uh, over this long duration, uh, like Voyager and others, uh, we have some better understanding and the timeline is such that the early part of the mission will have a, probably a faster tempo than the later part of the mission. And that will allow us to uh, develop the necessary uh, new generation of participants and leaders uh, as time goes on. We can look for apprentice roles in key positions that will support greater resilience over the long period of time. And we can key milestones that assure continued team and stakeholder interest. That needs to be a part of any mission planning of this duration. Next. So is a 50 mission uh, requirement feasible? Yes, with proper planning. Planning for the supporting organizations and team, for spacecraft reliability and a resilient ground system. So I've talked a little bit about the overall organization and team. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Clay Smith to talk about spacecraft reliability. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, so as Glenn mentioned, I'll be talking about the reliability assessments that we're doing. Um, and you see the list of people uh, working this particular aspect. I do want to uh, identify uh, Rika Edwards, uh, you know, she was our intern for the past several months and a lot of the analysis you'll see in this is uh, her work doing a lot of the heavy lifting going through databases and, and whatnot. So I just want to uh, mention her on the outset. Next slide, please. Uh, so as Glenn mentioned, uh, reliability is part of the longevity um, look at what we're doing with the interstellar probe study. Uh, we have this aspirational goal that a spacecraft needs to operate for at least 50 years. And as Glenn mentioned that uh, this is uh, outside of what NASA typically does and certainly well outside what uh, a, a mission has, has had to uh, put down as a requirement heretofore. Um, so a couple 
things that we're looking at for the reliability questions are what does the historical record tell us about long duration missions? Is this possible? What do the statistics from this uh, allow us to say? Uh, and then looking at not just the durations, but what were the, uh, the technical challenge? What, what were the things that ended missions uh, prematurely or just ended missions uh, uh, you know, at, at the end of, of their run of those particular spacecraft? Uh, and then with that, help develop this analytical framework that provides confidence to the decision makers in the science community that a spacecraft can indeed work for at least 50 years. Um, as part of that, uh, we are putting together a reliability assessment of the baseline design, which uh, Dr. Uh, James Kennison talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, so identify the risk drivers and what possible mitigations are for those, uh, quantify the probability of success and quantify the uncertainties uh, around such a metric. Um, and all of that is being done on the, the baseline design. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the questions that we're asking are certainly germane to uh, what we're trying to do with the interstellar probe study, but they talk to a lot of other um, parts of what NASA needs to look at. So there are many missions that are upcoming in the National uh, Academy Decadal Survey that are looking at targets in the outer solar system. And a lot of these missions may require 20 plus years. Uh, again, that is uh, a requirement longer than what uh, NASA puts down for, for missions now. Uh, so the, the processes that we come up with, the, the data that we identify can certainly help uh, those missions. Um, there are other things in terms of how we support uh, human exploration. Uh, so questions about uh, maintenance and sparing uh, come into play. There, there is a very real constraint on the, the amount of mass you can carry and the volume you can carry with spares. So that means that the systems themselves need to be able to last a very long time. Uh, and the longer you can push something like that, the less spares you need to carry. Um, the, the other overarching concern, at least for electronics, is that the electronics industry now is dominated by consumer electronics that are on a very short lifespan, on the order of, you know, three, five year kind of, of turnaround time. Very different from things the electronics industry several decades ago, where that was not the case, that, that longevity was, or was certainly longer than the, the you know, three to five years. Uh, and then there's also this, this balance between uh, having space infrastructure uh, last a very long time versus how you do tech refresh. And so, to the extent that we identify technologies that can push out um, uh, durations further and further, there's a lot more questions that have to be done with, with how, how often uh, these infrastructure spacecraft need to be transitioned. Next. Uh, so a little bit about what the historical record is telling us. So we started looking at a, a database called the Space Track Database from a, a UK company, which track all launches since Sputnik. Uh, they had about 180 spacecraft identified as, as interplanetary. As we started looking at those, there were a lot of technology demonstrators, uh, very short-lived impactors, uh, there were some launch failures in there. So as we called those out, we ended up with a, a data set of about 70 interplanetary spacecraft, uh, representing uh, well over 700 uh, on-orbit uh, you know, operational years. Uh, so when we start taking a look at that data set, what we see is that the large majority of missions do not end in failure. They end in uh, well, they're either still active, ongoing, or they end for 
reasons like uh, they ran out of fuel, the mission ended for budgetary reasons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, that, that starts to bode well for uh, what the, the missions uh, uh, can do. Uh, when we start looking at the, the missions that ended in failure, what you see with the, the bar chart uh, on the, the red bars, there isn't any one particular failure mode that is dominating this. So that says that there isn't a, you know, one glaring challenge that must be overcome. It, it is coming from a wide variety of things. So we need to be aware of that as uh, we start looking at um, the, the baseline design. Uh, more analysis and, and uh, information will be uh, put into uh, papers being published at the RAMS conference. Uh, it's a reliability, availability, maintainability symposium in January. Uh, and there'll be a, probably a couple other papers to follow after that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the chart you're looking at here is these 70 spacecraft uh, plotted with their actual mission duration versus their design life requirement. And that line that you see in the middle of that is where you get the, the equal design life versus actual. And what you're starting to see here is that a majority of these things last well past their design life. So it says that um, the community uh, does a very good job of building spacecraft uh, and they last for a very long time. Uh, when we start looking at the, the statistics from other papers, you see that this is consistent that, um, and, and, and across the, the field, not just interplanetary spacecraft, but geo spacecraft and LEO spacecraft. And it starts to talk about spacecraft last a very long time once you get past the, the early commissioning phase. Uh, we also took a look at this data and, and did some statistical analysis looking at the durations that these things are saying. Now, a lot of the durations, you know, the spacecraft ended not due to failure, but were operational when the mission ended. So that is taken into account with this thing called a survival analysis. And what we see from that is that with, with the spacecraft we have here, the mean duration is on the order of 53 years. So this bodes very well for getting to and making a requirement for 50 years. Next. So for long duration missions, we need to look at how we do testing and what kind of knowledge do we need to, to gather for how things fail, what things fail, uh, what are the likely failure mechanisms that are going to occur out at uh, 50 years uh, and, and beyond. Uh, so as part of this, we're identifying what physics of failure models need to be uh, put in place, uh, models for uh, electronics, for the uh, printed circuit board components, uh, looking at uh, chips and uh, what feature size, for example, has to say about reliability. So we can look at the, the, the record and Voyager, for example, is flying 40, 50 year old technology. So what does that say? Can it say anything about uh, flying technology that is going to be 2020s or 2030s kind of technology? Uh, we need to, to look at that transfer function. Uh, other kinds of components, high voltage components, uh, are, are things to worry about. What does it say about our sensors? Things with moving parts like thrusters and valves and other mechanisms. How do seals and lubricants degrade over time in this kind of environment? And, and the one I didn't talk about on that list is the radioisotope power systems. We're in touch with the Glenn Research Center um, out in, uh, out in uh, uh, Cleveland about what their technology is looking at and, and how they are looking at things going forward and how they are looking at th uh, requirements that are this long. Um, so part of this then is how do we take all that information and incorporate that into uh, a testing program? And for that, we're, we're leveraging a lot of the expertise that the University of Maryland uh, Kelsey Center has 
in starting to look at those frameworks and what information needs to be collected for this. Next, please. Uh, this kind of physics of failure model needs to be folded into the, the things that reliability engineers already do. So uh, whether it's um, uh, probabilistic risk assessments or failure modes and effects analysis, fault tree analysis, all these things are a way to understand the uncertainty and understand the probabilities. And so there's this feedback loop between understanding failure modes and developing models uh, what the physics of failure modes or the physics of, of failure models tell us about how much testing needs to be done. All of this wraps up into start to understand the uncertainties and start to quantify the risks to provide that confidence uh, to the decision makers and to the science community. Next, please. So we tend to talk in turn from reliability in terms of hardware, but it's not just hardware. We need to look at how can we craft mission success criteria to make a more robust mission. So if we have a requirement for some type of instruments, can we make instruments that start to overlap? So if we lose one type of instrument, can we make up either through inference or direct measurements the other questions that are being asked by the science community? And so all of that needs to be pulled together so it's not completely separate and it starts to inform the reliability content. Uh, the other part about resilience is, again, not just hardware and not just, well, we need to fly two of something in order to make it more reliable. Yes, that's part of what we're looking at, but we're also looking at how do we do fault management design? Do we apply um, artificial intelligence to make that a little bit more robust? Uh, what does the autonomy system look like? Um, can we put in functional redundancy and, and how do automated crossovers work during a failure and contingency? So all of this as a holistic um, uh, design activity is all being brought to bear in, in um, how we're interfacing with the, the engineering team. Next, please. So going forward, uh, we're engaging with the larger community as, as Glenn was talking about with a number of, of organizations. Uh, so from you know, questions to the broader community, are, are there other data sources that we should be using? Uh, the physics of failure models for and in the space environment um, need to talk to uh, current and near-term technologies. Um, we're trying to gather lessons learned from all long duration missions. And as Glenn mentioned, not just space missions, but are there other analogs that we can pull from? And then finally, are, are we asking the right questions? Is there others that we should be asking? And so we're, you know, this is an invitation for feedback. Uh, with that, that's my last slide. And I'll turn it over to Sally Whitley, who will talk about the ground segment. Hi, so my name is Sally Whitley, and uh, as Clay said, I'm going to be talking about the ground segment longevity study. Next slide, please. Um, so the interstellar probe mission does require a ground segment that, that provides infrastructure to receive and interpret data for many, many decades into the future. And unlike the space segment, the ground segment can be maintained and repaired. Um, that is a blessing and a curse because it means that things will change over time and we need to plan for that and we need to understand how we're going to deal with it. So the ground segment is also the most distributed aspect of the mission. Um, it requires multiple organizations and multiple nations working together um, over the entire course of the mission. So it's not just a, a specific period of time where we have uh, this cooperative effort. It goes across the entirety of the mission. Um, so the longevity management has to include formalized processes and policies that ensure that the knowledge is maintained um, and transferred from generation to generation over the course of the mission um, so that the data returning from the spacecraft decades and decades into the future can still be interpreted into information and so that stakeholder organizations have the endurance to support the commitments that they make to supporting the interstellar probe mission. Next slide, please. So this is our um, basic block diagram. It's not dissimilar from, from other ground segments. 
However, the challenge that Interstellar Probe faces is understanding what this means in terms of longevity. So we look at it uh, with a bunch of different dimensions. Um, we are concerned with the ownership of the individual pieces of the ground segment. We're concerned about the interfaces uh, between the organizations that own individual pieces of the ground segment. We are very concerned about the upgrade complexity associated with each of these individual pieces, and we're concerned with the knowledge management um, for the entirety of the ground segment. Next slide, please. So knowledge retention affects every aspect of this mission and every aspect of the block diagram of its uh, ground segment. Um, how are we going to store system documentation? There's, there's a running gag uh, in the study team that we're going to wind up having to use cuneiform tablets because we can guarantee that those will still be around 50 years from now. Um, but the truth of the matter is that if we're talking about electronic data storage, um, we face a tremendous challenge in that the uh, electronic data format that we choose will have to be to have guaranteed support and maintenance over the course of interstellar probes lifetime and no electronic data format has ever lasted that long. Um, so this is a consideration that the team needs to uh, take into account when it's planning how it's going to store its knowledge. Um, there's the option of going with paper documentation, um, which we've also discussed, but that also requires a huge long lasting commitment on the part of the storage organization. And there are horror stories from history um, about uh, lost, artifacts and lost documents that were accidentally discarded because somebody didn't know what they were. Um, so we need to have a plan in place for storing reams and reams of paper if this is the choice that the team makes. We need to understand how many copies we're going to keep. We probably want them to be distributed so that we can um, mitigate the risk of a catastrophic loss. Um, and then we need to understand how they can be accessed and by whom and when can they be checked out. All of these things need to be figured out. So knowledge retention formats have to be agreed upon across the mission from the beginning. This has to be an agreement across all of the organizations. Um, there's going to be a lot of decades that pass in between the time when the critical engineering knowledge gets recorded um, and when its end users need it uh, to help the mission achieve success. Um, and, and the original knowledge owners are not going to be able to be available for consultation. And I make this point specifically because this is still an aspect of Voyager's knowledge retention. We still call people who were there at the time, and this is not going to be an option for Interstellar Probe. So the mission is going to need to follow um, formalized practices and principles of, um, of knowledge management, and uh, which is a study uh, and a discipline unto itself. Next slide, please. For the ground data system, the Mission Operations Center and the Science Op Operations Center infrastructure, we have some very concrete recommendations that are coming from years and years of, of experience, particularly uh, with the New Horizons mission, which has been going for 13 years now. Um, for software, we need to um, develop our software with as much platform independence as we can achieve. And this is because what we know is that whatever platform we choose to develop our software in, it will be obsolete within the next couple of decades. So platform independence to the extent possible is imperative. Um, we would like to develop our software with automated testing. Um, this is an initial investment uh, that, the, that NASA will need to make in order to achieve the mission, but it's going to save the mission a whole lot of blood, sweat, and tears um, further down the line when we get closer to, um, to mission goals. And uh, finally, we would recommend developing software that is Indian neutral. Um, and this is based on some very painful lessons uh, learned from New Horizons. Um, which have included dealing with, uh, with an Indian switch. So um, we would expect this to be an issue in the future as well, and we would recommend developing Indian neutral software. For hardware, um, we need to take into account the fact that our hardware platforms are also going to be obsolete uh, within the next couple of decades. So we need to establish a formal refresh and upgrade schedule with rolling wave planning, um, in order to make sure that we have what we need uh, to interpret our data in, in the future. Um, another option would be to go with a cloud computing um, platform, but that comes with its own challenge, which is 
um, that the vendor providing the cloud computing services would have to have longevity. Um, and this is obviously one of the biggest considerations for Interstellar Probe in general, is making sure that the commitments that we make now can be kept 50 years from now. Um, so one of our recommendations is also that the Interstellar Probe mission should have a technology maven that should be a formalized role that follows the same succession planning recommendation, recommendations that the other engineering roles have. Next slide, please. Um, finally, one of the greatest challenges that Interstellar Probe faces is getting data back from the spacecraft. Um, the communications infrastructure that the study is baselining for the first 10 years of operations is the DSN. However, after that, we're assuming that DSN is not going to necessarily be available. So Interstellar Probe will need to be compatible with the next generation infrastructure, and that next generation infrastructure is gonna have to be in place. Um, the NASA cannot possibly embark on an interstellar probe mission without a committed plan for the communications and infrastructure that succeeds DSN. Um, and sponsoring organiz organizations will have to have firm commitments um, on the development and timing of this infrastructure um, that it should be available for, for interstellar probe. Um, additionally, we, uh, the study is baselining the planetary data system for data collection. Um, this is um, subject to the other concerns about hardware and software that the ground data system has. What makes this uh, in particular notable is the fact that it's multi-organizational, so this will not simply be the responsibility of a developing organization, but rather it will need to come, in, uh, it come with agreements between multiple organizations um, that will adhere to the same standards, um, allowing their infrastructure to be uh, available to Interstellar Probe 50 years into the future. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to the above, um, we have a couple of overarching recommendations for the ground segment of the Interstellar Probe mission. Um, the, the Interstellar Probe mission is going to need to have organizational backup plans. Um, we need to be relying on governmental and academic institutions wherever possible because these organizations have a tendency to be longer lived than commercial organizations. Um, we need to identify any international and multi-organizational commitments and agreements very early in the study process and we need to understand the interfaces and dependencies between those organizations and nations. We need to have formalized backup plans that take into account the significance and the urgency of each contributing organization's piece. Um, they need to take into account the scarceness of the resource that each organization is providing. Um, and we need to have an understanding and a plan for what it would take to restart or replace a capability if it should be lost. Um, to return to uh, the rest of the discussion and kind of wrap it up, um, what we'd like to say is that we do have the capability of building long-lasting spacecraft and instruments. Um, what we really need to develop um, in order to attack the, the interstellar probe mission is um, the, the testing and modeling capabilities that will give us confidence in interstellar probes hardware and software processes. Um, and we need to develop a diverse team that can manage and operate the mission during its flight with a, with a carefully planned succession process. Herewith endeth my speech. All right, thank you very much to our panelists. And now we're gonna have our question and answer session. So the first question is for Glenn and it's, has the Oxford Electric Bell operated since 1840 without any hands-on maintenance? Well, uh, the answer as best I understand is no. Uh, there's, uh, you can reach out and there's a couple of articles, well, Wikipedia article, there's an article in the Smithsonian uh, archives about the, the uh, Oxford Electric Bell. Uh, the, uh, the, there's two interesting things. Uh, there's speculation of which will fail first, the electric piles or the, the pendulum mechanism. Um, and the other uh, interesting thing is no one quite knows what the electric piles, the batteries, are made of, how they're constructed. There's speculation. So there's a number of individuals that just can't wait for it to completely fail so they can tear it apart and do a DPA. 
Okay, thank you very much, Glenn. And the next question is for Clay. Um, and I think it's more of a comment on one of your slides where uh, William Kurth asked, not sure where the 50 year medium lifetime, lifetime came from. I'm wondering if you can expand on that. Sure, so the analysis uh, that we're looking at is not just taking the average of the durations because like I said, the majority of these missions did not fail, right? So they ended, they, the spacecraft were operational when the mission ended. So the type of analysis accounts for that and it's called right sensor data. Uh, so you don't assume a failure at the time the mission ended, if it was still working. And so when you do that analysis, what you see is uh, the, the spacecraft durations are widely distributed with a mean of 53 years for that distribution. Thank you, Clay. And the next question is also for you, Clay, and it's from Brian Niffy and Eager. How does the 50 year lifetime and reliability requirements interact with the system weight constraint for the desired launch vehicle in orbit? Yeah, that, that's, so at, at the outset, from a reliability perspective, uh, in order to meet mission requirements, you know, we could have, you know, fly multiple versions of uh, payload instruments or, or spacecraft systems. And we could put in, you know, three backups. Uh, however, um, in order to meet the, the mass constraints to fit within the um, uh, Delta V requirements, Right, there, there's obviously this, this um, uh, envelope of how much mass and volume you can fly. And so you now have these competing requirements of spacecraft needs to be as light as possible, but for reliability, we want more and more backup. Uh, so that's, that's the give and play there. Thanks, Clay. And the next question is also, again, for you, Clay, and it's from Steve Tybalt. Does long-term cumulative outgassing pose concerns for optical instruments? Does this possible drive different material selections or for longer uh, duration bakeouts? Uh, that is outside my expertise. Uh, Glenn, can you answer that one? Well, I, I can at least uh, provide, uh, provide some light on the subject. Uh, the New Horizons mission, uh, which has now been operating in space for 13 years, uh, we've done some recent calibration of the long range reconnaissance imager. And its performance is within 1% of the performance at launch. Uh, so over a 13 year period where you would think the greatest damage would be uh, occurring, and also we went uh, by Jupiter where we got the most of our radiation, although we didn't get close to Jupiter. Um, we see no degradation whatsoever in the optics for the New Horizons LORI instrument. Thank you, uh, Clay and Glenn. And the next question is for you, Glenn, and is from John Kirsch. Longevity of funding would seem to be a critical consideration. Are you looking at alternative funding sources for an interstellar probe over its lifetime? For example, transferring support to a philanthropic organization at some point? We have not. Uh, I know there's some discussion about alternate ways of, of supporting this. Um, and that may be an interesting discussion at some point in time. The, the duration actually is not un, unreasonable for an organization such as NASA to, to pay for. Um, the, you know, Voyager is now operated for 43 years uh, and, and it has some challenges because they didn't plan for it to be operating for so long. I believe with proper planning and proper support, uh, the, the investment, the initial investment will be made by the citizens of the United States. And as long as possible, they should be the stakeholders in that. Uh, we could have that interesting discussion, but I, my own bias is that it would remain within the NASA family, uh, assuming that that support would be continued. Thank you, Glenn. And the next question is for Sally, and it's from William Kurth. 
And it asks, has an ASCII text been around for over 50 years? Uh, so the answer is actually yes. Uh, it's been around for about 57 years. However, it's undergone multiple revisions um, in that process. So I'm not sure that we would want to rely on that. Um, but so yes, it has been around for over 50 years. Thank you, Sally. And the next question is from Ken Hibbard. Are there plans to address the potential incompatibility that the next generation communication platforms to replace or supplement the DSN will need to support the interstellar probe technology, but this technology may become obsolete over the mission lifetime compared to what newer missions may use? Do you, accept, do you expect interstellar probe alone to sustain this capability? So I can give this to Glenn and then if Clay or Sally wants to chime in as well, that would be great. Well, I, I think there's several ways to look at that. It's possible they will be certainly looking at uh, changes in technology and support, but many of the systems that are putting in place do have long lifetimes as long as they're planned for. Uh, DSN itself has now been around for 60 years. Uh, it's been upgraded to be used uh, from, I guess, S-Band originally to, uh, we use X-Band typically today. Uh, so I think there has to be greater thought that we, and that is work that's to, uh, ahead of us uh, as to what we recommend. Uh, I believe it is sustainable. Uh, we just have to have the uh, plans and uh, uh, resolve to, to assure that this mission will work. And my guess is there will be enough other missions that will be interested in using the same technologies or similar technologies that will have a certain weight to maintain uh, a set of capabilities that will be quite reasonable in the 2030 to 2080 timeframe. Thank you very much, Glenn. And I think those are all the questions that we have now. So I can wait a few moments to see if any other questions come in. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions, so let's go ahead and wrap it up. Oh, we just got one, one follow question to come in, and that's to Glenn from William McKinnon. Has collaboration with private companies been considered to help build a larger team of engineers and management and possibility speed up the engineering process? Uh, for the study, uh, we've reached out to other universities and we're reaching out to uh, organizations like Goddard, we haven't reached out in the study uh, to other, uh, other organizations at this point in time, but we have started to cast the net uh, wider as we gather information uh, for, the, for the study itself. Thank you very much, Glenn. All right, and so I think now we're gonna, oh, another question just came in as well. And it's from Kirk Voland. If on-orbit failures that happen tend to occur early in mission lifetimes, is there a mission design that would allow for a controlled commissioning program on orbit? And I, I, th I give that to you as well, Glenn. Well, we haven't thought about uh, that. We have, we have talked about certain uh, subsystems, uh, which we think would not necessarily operate for, ver for such a long period of time. Um, I think, uh, that a delayed commissioning uh, doesn't buy a lot because the failures usually in uh, infinite mortality are often design related. Um, uh, and we'll have to take a careful look at it, but I, my recommendation would be to continue to uh, provide uh, commissioning as early as possible to understand what's going on but you have to be very careful with limited life items. So one of the things that we will be considering is what are potential lim life limiting items? How do you manage them for such a long period of time? I think that would be the most important thing uh, in terms of, of when you tend to operate uh, elements of the system from, from instruments to subsystems. 
Thank you very much, Glenn. And now we have our last question, and it's to Clay. Is there information of the frequency that spacecraft have small failures that do not end missions? Uh, there certainly is information about that. Um, those kind of anomalies and failures that don't end a mission don't tend to get uh, into press releases and therefore not in the public record. So it's hard to find across the board. Now, when we're looking at our own internal spacecraft, what we see is the same kind of trends that we get a lot of anomalies early and then they start uh, becoming more and more infrequent as time goes on, which mirrors the same kind of behavior that we're seeing with failures for the larger population. Thank you very much, Clay. And that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much to our panelists and thank you for attending today's webinar. The next webinar will be on Thursday, October 15th at noon Eastern time titled Dwarf Planets and KBOs, Fossils of Solar System Evolution, where we will have a panel presentation by Kirby Runyon, Noemi Pania Alonzo, and William McKinnon. Please visit the Interstellar Probe Study website for more information about the Interstellar Probe Study and to view information on future webinars and events. Also, please consider signing up for our listserv under their community involvement section of the website to make sure you're getting the latest information on upcoming webinars and events. Thanks for joining us and have a wonderful day.